Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar, Ergonomics with a New Workplace Best Practices to Deliver Productivity and ROI for Your Organization. I want to thank you for attending today. I also want to thank the Corporate Facilities Council who is providing this October benefit of the month. The Corporate Facility Council is the largest of IFMA 17 councils. The Corporate Facilities Council is a networking and education resource for real estate and facilities professionals strategically planning for and managing office environments, particularly headquarters and large campuses. Their membership hails from 51 countries and engage with and support each other and other professions. This presentation was part of the Corporate Facilities Council's First Wednesday series, monthly webinars that are one of the Council's many benefits. You may join the CFC by calling our Member Services Department at 713-623-4362. There is a $55 annual fee. If you are joining partway through the year, your membership will be prorated. Also, IFMA has many benefits. As the facility management industry evolves, it's crucial that you stay aware of trends, best practices, and other developments affecting the profession. As a member of the world's premier association serving the facility management profession, IFMA wants to be there for you by offering exclusive access to value and resources that set you apart from your fellow professionals. To further enhance your membership experience, each month you will receive a message with an exclusive benefit or opportunity created just for you, our IFMA member. Okay, and you can look on that slide and it kind of gives you a summary of some of the current benefits you receive as well. Okay, also, if during this webinar we have any questions, please feel free and type them into the chat box. We will answer the questions as we go through the program, and there will be a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar as well. Um, also, please be aware, yes, we will be sending out a PDF copy of the presentation within the next couple of days. Okay, today the presenter of today's webinar is Rick Spencer, MS. He is well versed in the fields of behavioral science and ergonomic health. Rick has amassed an ever-expanding expertise in the science of systems, from training performance modalities to OSHA compliance to performance-based ergonomics programs, development, and management. His undergraduate and graduate studies at California Lutheran University, combined with successful research tenures at UCLA and Telecare, and advanced program development work with numerous Fortune 500 companies have contributed to Rick's extensive knowledge base and dynamic grasp of behavioral modifi modification and essential human factor determinants. Okay, thank you, Rick. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Joshua. I'd like to thank uh, IFMA for inviting me to speak today and all of you who are attending. Um, happy Halloween to all of you. I know many IFMA members, and um, from the creativity that I've seen with the uh, facilities design and, and decoration, I can only imagine uh, some of the environments you're in today, so um, it's probably a, a very exciting day for you all. So today, as Josh said, we're going to be talking about designing an ergonomics program for the new workplace, and uh, there's some critical uh, topics that we're going to be discussing today, such as uh, the workplace of the future, um, persona-based marketing, sit-stand uh, workstations and the sit-stand debate, as well as a, a growing trend for home or mobile working and how facilities managers and those uh, involved uh, with their clients in designing facilities are becoming involved uh, with that trend. I first just want to start with some information on musculoskeletal health. You know, in ergonomics, um, we're trying to avoid lost productivity, um, but many times that's measured with um, musculoskeletal health measures. And it's always surprising to us, especially uh, in trying economic times, that our clients will say, you know, ergonomics is uh, not getting the emphasis that it needs in our organization. Uh, many of our leaders, our executives, uh, are feeling that uh, we're doing a good job. We don't have injuries, and um, we have low injury rates, and they're using those measures to determine success. And so the question is, are we succeeding with ergonomics? Well, we certainly are advancing the science, and we're advancing the discipline of design. Um, however, there's not only a lot of work to be done, as we'll discuss today, there's a lot of uh, concerning evidence of why some of these trends will only uh, increase as far as musculoskeletal health. So I want to start with some of that data to uh, raise your awareness. 
uh, you'll find on the top left an interesting statistic about baby boomers. Many of you may already know about this. You're dealing with uh, aging workforce concer concerns. That's a large uh, component of your organizational plan. Um, as you can see, 40% of the workforce are baby boomers. And if you couple this with um, research um, from AARP that shows that when surveyed, only 40% of those people who will be in the age range of 65 to 70 in the next five years are planning to retire. And what that means is that we're not only going to have an aging workforce, we're going to have people working longer. Um, so they're going to be in the workforce longer than what most people consider the traditional retirement age. So that becomes a challenge because we know as people age, uh, they have certain requirements as far as facilities design. And so today we're going to be looking at some of those things, which are not just ergonomic related. They um, also entail uh, lighting, uh, noise, and uh, other requirements. Um, we also have an alarming uh, increase in obesity. So if you were to look at 69% of the population of 20 plus um, people who are 20 years or older, you would find that they are considered overweight or obese. And how does this affect what we call musculoskeletal health? Uh, well, there's two major issues. One is carrying more weight puts more stress on the body, and that causes uh, wear and tear. But second, it also affects our recovery process. And so the micro trauma that we may experience uh, in the workplace um, is reduced as far as our recovery capabilities. Now, another interesting st statistic is when we survey our um, employee groups uh, from our clients, we find that 70% of employees will report regular musculoskeletal symptoms. And this means that they have discomfort, which they experience either daily or weekly. And that's quite um, varied from looking at injury statistics. So we can go into plenty of uh, organizations who will say that um, you know, we have a very low incident rate, very few injuries. Um, however, one of the things we always I uh, find interesting is as we're doing walk-arounds of those facilities, you see several people with wrist braces or you know, Costco industrial-sized bottles of Advil that people are passing out. So there are signals out there that show us that people are in discomfort. And when you do survey them, when they just feel like they're able to talk about it, they do come forward and say, I am experiencing discomfort. However, if the only mechanism for them to report this data is a workers' compensation claim, we see a serious disconnect. And the last uh, informational graphic on this slide is the new work modalities. So what is the workplace today? Is it different from 10 years ago? Is it different from five years ago? I think you would all agree yes. And is it going to be different one year from now and five years from now? The answer is yes. And uh, not only yes, but at an increasing rate of change. Um, the speed of technology and the speed which uh, technology changes is becoming a major part of our life. And that's uh, demonstrated with um, you know, all of the different devices and ways that we access our work and that we work and collaborate. Now, the concerning thing when we talk to our clients is how they are prepared to address these issues. So when we look at uh, resource capacity and their plans and their programs for addressing these items, um, there are some serious gaps. So we do see that. Um, when looking at, for example, wellness programs, well, musculoskeletal um, disorders make up the greatest amount of disability. They also, um, if you look at reported issues to physicians, uh, musculoskeletal issues, specifically neck and back pain, are number, number the second uh, highly reported item, second only to allergies and the common cold to a physician. And so most wellness programs are focusing on uh, obesity and um, arthritis, or, excuse me, uh, heart disease um, and um, cancer and serious significant catastrophic issues, which they need to focus on those. Those individual claims are very expensive and they have huge impacts on the organization um, and outside the organization. However, when you look at the prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders and you accumulate the cost of those, there's a significant issue. And we don't find that being addressed with, uh, with most programs. We've also done several surveys with uh, thousands of employees and found that if we were to ask them you know, the questions that a physician would ask about uh, pain and about symptoms, that one in 13 employees would be eligible for a workers' comp claim. Now, there's no organization that has that level of an incident rate, um, and that's because most organizations 
um, you know, have a workers' comp system and a healthcare system, and the employees choose to use the healthcare system to address these issues. So many times uh, these issues are going uh, under the radar, if you will, and not being measured. And the research shows that um, knowledge-based workers are what many people may um, categorize as white-collar workers do not find uh, the workers' comp system uh, to be something that is, they associate with. They, they feel that that's more of an industrial blue-collar mechanism and that uh, the healthcare system is more designed uh, for their type of issue. Uh, on the bottom left, you see that um, there's a, a real gap in, in resource allocation, which shows that if you have 1,000 employees with one in four having discomfort, uh, which is actually a low mark, as we showed, most organizations have 70% of their employees having discomfort, um, those, addressing those claims or those cases, if you will, would take two to four hours on average for resolution. And so for that 1,000 employees, that's 10 hours per week. So for those of you who are involved in your ergonomics program as part of your facilities group, um, you know, many of you may not have that time. And that's where we start to find gaps and challenges for organizations. And um, as I've already kind of referenced and uh, alluded to, in the bottom right, we look at uh, employees who actually report discomfort and pain uh, to their organization outside of just using their, their health care system. And our research and surveys show that when we ask employees, do you have discomfort, do you have pain, and have you told anyone about it, 95% of the population do not mention anything. So as we can see with the, the trends in musculoskeletal health and uh, the supply and resource issues, there's a lot of opportunity for us. And today we're going to be talking about solutions for you, hopefully giving you ideas so that you can walk away with uh, items uh, to implement. So we'll move on to the topic of the workplace of the future. And um, we've built in some polling questions to help you interact and, and to get some of your feedback uh, in this presentation. So we're going to present the, uh, the first um, poll question right now and give you about 30 seconds to respond. OK. So the, the poll question was looking at, uh, over time, if individuals adapt or become accustomed to noise and increased uh, physical proximity uh, associated with collaborative workspaces. And, and Josh, I can't see the um, results. So can you just share the results of how people responded? Certainly. The results are 83% true, 17% false. OK, great. So the answer for this question is false. And um, the research shows that employees do not uh, develop habits to noise. They experience continued cognitive load or mental load and crowding stress even months and years after a higher density environment. So most people may, when thinking about that question, say, you know, that yeah, that's true because they're expecting what the uh, crowding and the noise issues uh, are going to be present when they show up to work. But do they actually adapt? And that's the critical word in that question is, do they adapt? So they become familiar and they, and they expect it. But as far as the productivity elements and the output, um, they do not uh, typically adapt. So let's look at some ways that we can design the workplace of the future to address not only this, but uh, other challenges. So the trend has been uh, going on for over a decade of open, collaborative workspaces. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, have already implemented uh, these types of environments, and you have uh, success stories and challenges. Others, others of you, I know, are considering it, and you're thinking about how the plan can be rolled out and implemented. 
and the, the trends that continue are increasing real estate density. So we have one client that created a large uh, facilities plan. It's a global client with uh, over 100,000 employees. And with this plan, they were able to say, we can reduce our real estate footprint by two-thirds by using uh, this plan. And so that obviously gets the attention of uh, a lot of stakeholders in the organization, the executives, um, people worried about sustainability, um, employees, all of these uh, individuals um, have an interest in this. And some of the things that we see with you know, that type of plan is a dynamic or shared seating assignment or workspace, as well as the uh, collaboration. So collaboration is a huge theme around these open environments that you know, if you have closed offices, closed walls, high cubicles, people don't talk, they don't collaborate, they're instant messaging their neighbors, and we're not creating this culture of collaboration, which we need because we are a knowledge-based workforce and uh, we need to be innovating and we need to be growing and we need to be moving in that direction. So with this 10 years of research on the success of these programs, we know one thing is being left out, and that is how we can increase focused work. So the push and the emphasis on these programs has been about collaboration, which is important. You know, you need to have collaboration for innovation, and if you're not innovating, you're falling behind and losing competitive advantage. So that is a priority. However, the importance of collaboration has, um, in many cases, left a gap as far as how focused work can be completed. So let's look at a couple examples about designs and what you need to be thinking about uh, when you're considering these plans. So the first is location. So where do employees work? We just talked about the workplace changing, and you've got what we call telepresence versus conventional. Um, I was just uh, working with a large uh, finance client, and um, this is a worldwide finance client uh, with um, credit card facilities, and they have a whole program where the interviewing and recruiting is done virtually, uh, the um, onboarding is done virtually, and the person starts first day in their home. So you can think about that experience where an employee never meets their manager in person, never shakes anyone's hand, never shows up to a building, gets a laptop shipped to their home, and they start work. Um, it's you know a very uh, interesting dynamic. Um, I was talking to one of my clients um, who works for a large technology company, and she said that she went through the same process, and she would have never taken the job if the technology company did not have this significant brand, that it was so foreign to her, that it was so um, challenging for her to really grasp that she wouldn't be going to an office and meeting with people, and she couldn't meet her, her future colleagues before she started. So, um, But it is you know, where we are today, and it's a growing trend. So. You've got virtualization, mobile computing, home-based workers. How do you address uh, the needs for those individuals? You also have usage. So you've got you know, the fixed versus uh, shared usage. So this is you know, what we're looking at with a traditional office environment. Do you have fixed workstations, fixed offices, or do you have the shared uh, open environment? And then you have layout considerations. How are the workstations configured? Are they open? versus cellular, are they fixed versus dynamic? So fixed being, you know, do you have an open work plan but the desks are fixed, um, which um, you know, we'll show you in a minute, doesn't accommodate a large uh, population. Um, so how do you consider the layout and look at both collaboration spaces but also mixed use and dynamic configurations? So when we look at the data, looking specifically at some of these elements, uh, we can see here, these are anthropometric results uh, with, based on an average population. And you can see at the top, if we provide a desk only, which is um, put at an average of 28 and a half inches, that would accommodate a minimum height of 5'8 and a maximum height of 6'1. So by just providing a desk that's the, uh, and a chair, um, that is the only um, range that we can accommodate. Now if we add a footrest, because we know the chair will have uh, adjusting seat pan height, uh, we can accommodate 5.5 five to 6.1. If we provide a desk, a keyboard tray, and a footrest, so we know we'll have the ability to raise the chair, we'll, know we'll have the ability to bring the keyboard input device down below the surface height, we can adjust to 4.11 to 6.1.
And if we provide a height adjustable desk um, plus some additional peripherals, we can accommodate four, five, to seven foot. So when you're thinking about this layout, when you're thinking about the open plans, you know, where do you fall? How, what is the accommodation that someone can expect? Um, because if you know, we're not accommodating these individuals, their forced postures will be creating that discomfort and those health issues uh, that become a challenge. And how will you be recording that data? How you, will you be serving those individuals to respond reactively? Or how will you be thinking proactively to make sure that you have the accommodations and that the employees will be using them? Um, and as you can see, a fact that we've listed uh, here on the slide, um, ergonomic injuries are disproportionate for people who are tall and very small which means that the tall and very small populations have a rate of three times the average of um, regular height employees. And this data demonstrates that. You know, if, if we're only providing a fixed desk, well, it's a very small population, 5, 8 to 6, 1, um, that can use that desk um, properly. The others, all the rest uh, below, have to adjust themselves and adjust their postures to try to accommodate to the work versus the work accommodating to the worker. And so that's a gap. So some of the problems that we see with um, the workstation designs in these open collaborative environments, employees rate noise as the number one cause of distraction, lower productivity, and increased stress. And you know, this may seem intuitive to some people because they, they walk in and they say, you know, where's my office? Where's my cube? How will I be able to do my work? And in, in many times, you know, we think about um, the collaboration space and how that collaborates and, and most organizations will then have uh, huddle rooms or smaller um, breakaway areas where people can do meetings or more private work. Um, but there's, there's still a gap. Um, offices typically utilize a linear-based overhead lighting scheme and if you use a linear-based um, desk configuration, there's lighting gaps. So that's something else that has to be considered and is often uh, left out. And density is frequently experienced as crowding. Um, so the psychological impact of employees, as we say, we're going to put uh, more people in less space, but by using these, uh, these designs, um, has an impact to employees. So we don't want to just talk about problems. We want to talk about goals and solutions. And so for noise, we need to absorb, block, cover, and consider acoustic reverberation. So is that in a part of your plan? For lighting, we need you know, correct lighting. Task lighting is a great way to accommodate for that linear-based model. And giving the employee the adjustability also impacts um, their, the variation that they may need. And that goes back to the trend we just discussed in the earlier slide about the aging workforce and the accommodations that uh, they will need. As we say in ergonomics, vision drives posture. And so lighting is a huge issue as far as considering ergonomic posture. And then with the space, we need to cultivate focused or heads down spaces that can be critical to corporate performance. Um, I spend a lot of time in Europe and so I spend a lot of time uh, on trains and you know the interesting thing about a train design is you have a quiet car and you have regular cars and people know that if I go to the quiet car I can expect that I can sleep, I can work, but I don't have to hear conversations in the background, I don't have to hear people uh, chatting. If I go to the regular car I know that I may be able to take a phone call, I may be able to chat with my neighbor or my colleague. And so that is a, a very common gap that we see in these open space plans is that um, you know, we've thought so much about collaboration and you know, we have these huddle rooms in these small offices for meetings, um, but how do we know where we can have an environment where people can focus and drive deliverables and drive content um, to their requirements? And we can see with the research on the, on the side panel, the work environment is seen as having a 20% impact on employee productivity. And this is also demonstrated in, in home working. You know, people that work at home report a 20% increase, um, an increase in productivity. However, the unfortunate thing is oftentimes because of their configuration at home, that productivity gain is uh, lost because of the awkward postures and the risk factors that they're introducing. So these are critical components when looking at the workplace of the future. All right, so we've uh, talked about our first topic. We're going to move on to messaging 
and uh, how you Hello, create. Uh, yes. I have one quick question. It says, sure. if all desks are at 30 inches, how does mm -hmm. this impact the size range of employees? Sure. So, you know, what that that question also depends on the environment. Um, so, in the U.S., um, you know, that would actually reduce uh, some of the statistics that we just looked at. If you were talking about uh, an Asian population, uh, we look at an Asian population, and for their average desk height, it should be 26 to 27 inches. Now, in, in the Nordic countries like uh, Europe, so Sweden and the Netherlands and some of those countries, Norway, um, they actual, because of their anthropometrics of the population, uh, 30 inches is a, is a good average. So um, if the question was, you know, what was the height? I'm sorry, Joshua? 33, in, I'm sorry, 30 inches. Yeah, so 30 inches, um, that would reduce, for the large global population, um, the adjustability. Or I should say the, the way that the employee would accommodate to the work. Thank you. All right, as we move into the persona-based messaging, uh, we're going to bring up our next poll question. Okay, are you able to see those results? I'm not, so if you don't mind reading them, that'd be great. Sure, it's 67% um, true, 33% false. Okay, great. And the question was, cultivating awareness achieves a behavioral change. Um, and the answer is false. So awareness has very little impact on behavioral outcomes. And I think um, something that uh, you may match to this is looking at uh, the obesity trend. So there's 30 years of public nutrition and you know, exercise health policy to, that has been growing to address obesity. But if awareness was all that we need, we'd all be eating right and exercising every day. And um, that's not happening. And so what happens is that awareness can increase your guilt, um, but it does not motivate change. And so understanding personal motivation, habits, and corporate culture is more important and effective in creating improved health outcomes. And so what we want to look at, um, especially in the changing work environment, is what kind of messaging and awareness um, do you have for your work design? So we just looked at the uh, work design of the future. Many of you may have already rolled out um, one of those uh, work plans. And again, many of you are, are planning one or considering it. And so whether you've already implemented it or you're in the process in the planning stage, what is your messaging strategy? And how do you uh, change behavior so that employees are using the workspace as it's designed. So we want to take some lessons on this topic from marketing. So asking questions like, is your message topically relevant? Is your message interesting? Is it timely? Um, is it the medium of delivery appropriate? What's the frequency? And is that sufficient for acquisition and retention? And is it efficient and visually pleasing? And I think um, the statement that you see at the bottom is critical. That you know, dusty policies and densely worded guides are not what employees are expecting. Employees are expecting to be engaged. So the, the days of counting on an email blast or posters or, or those things um, are, are not going to engage the workforce in a meaningful way that will change their behavior, which goes back to our poll question. How do we change behavior if we introduce a new workspace and a new work plan? And um, we saw this with uh, many of our clients where um, they would roll out these new work plans and, and they would create these guides and these tutorials and they assumed people would uh, you know, come into this new workspace and they would you know, use these guides like manuals and they would learn how to adapt and to accommodate themselves to these working environments. And it didn't work. Employees came in, they had questions, they had concerns, they were confused. Um, it had huge impacts to productivity. And 
again, we realized the big gap was engagement. You know, employees don't expect to show up and have to learn how to adapt. They expect someone to engage with them um, and help them understand the adapt adaptation. But going back to the poll question, also understanding their motivation. So it's one thing to say, well, here's the, the plan and here's how you're supposed to be using the work environment. But if we haven't engaged with the workforce, we don't know their motivations, we don't know their working styles, and that message may be a huge disconnect. So let's look at some um, ideas on how you're going to develop your message that will be part of your plan. So you know you have to think what we call in personas. Not every worker is the same. You can see here uh, we have examples of an executive who uses a tablet. They're they're very tech savvy. Um, they're very interested in on being on the cutting edge and, and pers uh, you know, giving that uh, persuasion to others. And you know that is their motivation. Uh, we have another individual who's responsible for regular deadlines, regular outputs, and they really have to deliver content and um, have focused work be their priority. Uh, you have an individual who's a shared service person, and they're supporting multiple departments and multiple organizations, and they are a floater, for example. So they don't necessarily uh, work in one spot. They have to accommodate to many environments so that they can serve their clients or their customers. A salesperson who needs to engage with the workforce, um, but also needs to engage with clients and has multiple client environments as well as um, collaboration environments. And an executive, someone who is responsible for stewarding the company, someone who's responsible for extreme attention and uh, you know has to factor in fatigue. And so all of these personas are examples of people in your work environment that you have to consider. And so you have to think about these questions that we've listed here that you'll receive in the presentation. The name and title, the profile and the role, the demographics, day-to-day -day goals, and the challenges. So what is your narrative? What are their motivations? What are their frustrations? You know, Knowing their frustrations in advance, um, you can accommodate and you can uh, create um, parts of your plan that will address these proactively. How do they work best, and what is their attention span? You know, how is is it focused work? Is it collaborative work? Um, do they need certain environments to achieve uh, those elements? So, what we've been doing with our clients is using multiple modalities. You know, the again, the idea of um, you know just creating a plan and just creating posters and email blasts um, is not enough for employee engagement. And that employee engagement is critical for motivation and change behavior. So we have a free um, smartphone app that's available to all of you. You can search uh, on Apple or Android or BlackBerry um, app stores under Healthy Working Plus. Um, you also have my email at the end of the presentation if you need this. And so this app um, is free, and it, it has basic ergonomic information, stretching exercises, but it also pushes out updates. So when we go back and we think about that executive that uses the tablet, or maybe the salesperson that uses the tablet, should we be expecting to have them engage with posters? Should we be expecting them to engage with an email? Or are they using uh, their tablet and applications as a way to stay connected and engaged? And so we allow um, organizations to brand this smartphone app with their own logos and use that tool as, uh, as part of our outreach. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see um, software that we actually use to help employees engage more intuitively with their work. So for example, when you ask an employee, how long do you work in a computer workstation um, and actually work on your computer, the average uh, results or the average response is um, 40 hours a week. Well, we know that's not true. The average, when you look at the research, is 12 hours a week. And what that means is that the employee is you know, working 40 hours a week, but they're not physically engaged with their keyboard and their mouse. They're not tethered to those things, tethered to their tear, chair for 40 hours a week. And by using a software like you see on the left to give them specific messages, we can encourage them to understand their working habits so that they can understand their motivations and they can be, um, you know, motivated to change. But we have to know, um, in this case, with this specific software, 
we don't um, talk about changing their activities as breaks, um, which a lot of uh, organizations use uh, rest breaks or, or break uh, messages. We actually, when we, we see that their thresholds are being met um, or exceeded, we communicate them in feedback that's called energizers and concentration boosts. And why is that message critical? Is because when you survey employees, they say that they associate breaks with poor job performance. So again, we know that employees are not tethered to their keyboard and their mouse, for example, for 40 hours. They have a chance to move. They have a chance to change their, their postures to address some of these musculoskeletal health issues. But how we message to them and how that connects with their motivation is critical for behavioral change. And so with the research that we found, uh, we, you know, again, employees' number one priority is job performance. How will I achieve my performance goals and how will I achieve my career goals? And whatever affects that job performance will be something that they will be motivated to engage with. So talking about themes like energy and concentration, those are um, you know, leading pillars that can help change behavior because it addresses motivation. Now we also uh, look at, quick. yes? What was the name of the app again? The name of the app is Healthy Working Plus, um, with the plus signal, so Healthy Space Working Plus. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, and that is available again in Apple, Android, as well as Blackberry. Um, I'm gonna show a quick video, just uh, one minute of this video, to talk a little bit about uh, the gaming culture and how we're addressing those that are coming into the environment that are used to uh, gaming technologies. So there won't be any audio on this, so you don't need to adjust your speakers. And we're just going to be looking at this for, again, less than a minute. All right, so there may be some things that you noticed with that uh, video that I want to point out. This is uh, content that we've created for our clients with their messaging campaigns. Um, and again, this is specifically around the persona of the people that have grown up with heavy video game use, um, games on their phones, games on their tablets, and you know they deviate towards that as far as a, a motivation of enjoyment. And what you saw, one of the things you, you may not have realized um, intuitively, but it, the camera was actually rotating 360 degrees. And that is to help tell a story with something that may be considered boring. You know, adjusting your workstation may not be a very sexy topic, but it is critical. And by just using that short uh, rotational uh, video production scheme, we're able to have it develop like a story. So it seems like it's a frame by frame uh, development. Another thing that you saw was the color schemes. So we had the red to green uh, color schemes that came up with the different adjustments. And that's what uh, you know, gamers are used to. They're used to some visual understanding of advancement, you know, whether it's points or whether it's levels. And so by using that color scheme, we can engage with them in a way that's more intuitive based on their motivation. So just another persona that sometimes is left out but is growing, and I wanted to use that as an example. Uh, we're also working with our clients to remove the barriers that come with adjustments of workstations. So many of our clients um, have policies where either an administrative or facilities coordinator needs to purchase uh, equipment for them or you know, a manager needs to approve things. And obviously there are significant budget concerns and significant spend concerns that I don't want to dismiss um, or minimize. However, we know that the research shows that the workspaces um, are not adaptable for a large percentage of the population. And the longer we take um, to um, address these issues, 
the more the motivation from the employee can change from I want to improve my workspace to the organization doesn't care about me. And what a huge gap if we have a motivated employee, a committed employee, someone that really believes in the mission, the vision of the organization, and something like a workspace changes their motivation on how engaged they are with that workforce. So we've created online catalogs um, through purchasing systems like Ariba, our procurement, uh, or we have a partner office relief that creates these catalogs and automates the ordering process. If you still need approvers, you can engage in that. You can uh, introduce those things. But the, the key point on this slide is what barriers exist for people to adapt to their workspace so that the workspace is adjustable for them. And if there are barriers, how can you overcome those barriers? And how can you give employees more control? Because again, they're the ones that have the motivation. And if we can tap into that motivation, we can really drive behavioral change. All right, we're on to our next topic, which is the uh, sit-stand debate. So time for our next poll question. Okay, Rick, we had 17% true and 83% false. Okay, so the question was, standing still is the opposite of sitting still. And it sounds like the majority of you uh, selected the correct answer, which is false. And this is really critical because I know all of you are being faced with the growing trend of sit-stand workstations. So with the media and uh, the information that's out there about sitting and standing, um, more people say, I want a sit-stand workstation, and I want to be healthy, that I hear sitting is the new smoking, and my chair is killing me, and all of these very dramatic messages. Um, so how do we address that? So what's the challenge? Well, everyone wants one. They're being marketed, again, using those dramatic messages I talked about, such as sitting disease. Um, not having one or restricting their use is increasingly perceived as negligent or cruel. Um, they're extremely expensive, which becomes a challenge. And the global supply chain is inconsistent. So if you're a global organization, trying to get a standard and trying to address this in a larger market is a huge challenge. So I'm going to summarize this real quick so I can make sure that we finish some of the other content, but you'll be receiving this presentation. But basically, the messaging that is, is out there about sitting is killing you and, and sitting is the new smoking is, is being uh, presented um, with a small variation, and that is, What's, what's killing us is being sedentary, so that is accurate. Sitting is a sedentary position. Not moving advances aging. It causes health deterioration. But the idea that standing, so the, uh, just by standing up um, throughout the day um, with your workstation and working maybe in large standing capacities and in large sitting capacities, just that movement is going to take us out of a sedentary uh, metabolic rate is inaccurate. And so that's the thing that we have to look at is how do we change from a sedentary posture to a moving posture? Now, there are advantages um, to uh, standing as far as collaboration and engagement. Um, you know, there's a lot of research about standing meetings and how those are more productive and take less time. Um, but when we're talking about uh, workstations, um, you know, again, what we need to focus on is movement. Um, so the idea that if we just introduce uh, a sit-stand workstation that we are going to address this sedentary posture is not accurate. And you know because it is a sedentary posture, one of the issues as well is that when we look at the research, most employees do not change their behavior. So the people that change their behavior are usually uh, pain-related issues. So people with significant back pain, hip pain, they have uh, a motivation, a signal to change their posture or to keep away from that pain. Um, so when we look at you know, stationary standing, it's a, it correlated with high, high incidence of low back pain, even in participants with no prior history of low back discomfort. So that means if we're just saying that people can stand and we're not providing uh, guidelines, those people can be uh, introduced to health effects that we were not intending to. So standing in a still position, as most of you observed in the poll question, 
is not uh, increasing the, the change that we're looking to, to accomplish. And again, when we look at people that um, introduce sit-stand workstations for a health or wellness benefit, um, there is uh, not significant evidence that behaviors change. So what about these tables? Well, if someone wants to stand periodically, great. That increases their engagement with their workstation and improves their satisfaction. But ergonomically speaking, very people need to stand as a matter of treatment. High adjustable tables, however, are useful because they enable us to fit the environment to the worker. So adjustable environments um, result in improved comfort and productivity. So the, the ROI or the return on investment on sit-stand workstations is very high when we look at um, people that move frequently. So again, if you have a fixed desk that you're adjusting the height for an individual worker to help accommodate them, and you have a lot of churn and a lot of movement in your organization, the facility's return on investment of providing adjustable tables versus uh, the facility's cost of adjusting fixed desks um, is positive. So it's important that we look at how we show uh, when there is an ROI for sit-stand workstations. And what I'm advocating for is that in that facility's perspective, there is value, there is return on investment. However, if the organizational um, direction and objective is, oh, we need to address this sitting disease, so sit-stand workstations should be rolled out and implemented, um, the research does not support that. And so that's the challenge is, um, you know, coping with this message and making sure that people understand, you know, really what we're trying to address. Now going back to the workplace of the future with the open environments where there's shared workstations and not fixed and assigned desks, obviously sit-stand workstations make a huge amount of sense because, again, looking back at that data that we looked at from the 5-8 individual to 6-1, that's not enough. That's not enough adjustability. And so um, the idea of using those um, workstations in the open collaborative plan as well as addressing facilities costs for high move organizations, there's some value. Um, where, the again, the objective is wellness and health, that's where we need to look further. So what do we do? What is my recommendation here? Well, stand up once every 15 to 20 minutes. Do you need a sit-stand workstation to stand up? Hopefully right now you're listening to me and you can stand up right now and actually move. So that's an opportunity that everyone has. And you know, when we, when we use that software and show employees the opportunities that they have to move throughout the day, that's where we can start to uh, introduce um, something that will affect their motivation. Um, each hour, take a three to four minute a break, which includes a brisk walk. Again, that breaks up sedentary posture. Use all available opportunities to increase your movement, and never sit through a commercial. So, you know, starting to look at your habits and starting to look at uh, the opportunities outside of work that can then develop habits that you bring to work. Um, this is again where we we look at our messaging and we say, hey, let's not stop with advice that is uh, just workplace related. All right, we're finishing up here, and we're on to uh, our, one of our final topics, which is uh, home and mobile working challenges. But we don't have a, a poll question for this, so I'm going to just go through this content and get to return on investment. So one of the things that we see with our clients is the increase of homeworking. And there's a few gaps that we see uh, with homeworking, which is um, they don't have a, a policy. And that policy is important because you have issues with disability. You know, we're seeing more workers' comp examples where employees are getting injured at home and they're claiming a workers' comp claim because, um, you know, for example, we had a client who had a, a woman trip over a doggy gate as they were going into the kitchen for a drink of water. And their argument was, if I was going to the, the kitchen or the break room at work, it would have been compensable, so it should be compensable at home. And so our, many organizations do not have a policy to address this. They say, well, working from home is a benefit. And so you can work from home, um, we'll give you a laptop, and then the rest is on you because you're getting the benefit of uh, reduced commute times, more flexibility, um, working in your, your pajamas, all of those things. So that is a huge gap. Now, how do we address this? Well, we've been introducing um, virtual technologies to assess and provide recommendations to employees. And um, this is becoming a huge um, tool for our clients because you know, they can't uh, have facilities managers or facilities professionals uh, going out to homes and designing homes for workers. 
And so there has to be a way to connect with these individuals and provide them with solutions. Um, so some of the benefits of this type of model is you know, reducing the cost of that delivery model, that support model, um, early identification of problems, so engaging the employee earlier. Um, there's increased service at a reduced cost. And again, improve responsiveness and employee satisfaction. Now, some people may argue, well, you know, is this level of engagement enough for employees? You know, if they're working at home and they're just getting uh, virtual assistance, you know, is that enough? And there's lots of research out there that shows, you know, for example, with the, our measurement tape here, that employees can um, measure themselves within 1.5 um, centimeters as a professional. So if a professional were to design their workspace and, and ask them to adjust themselves based on this design, or give the advice to the employee and the instructions to the employee, the research shows with thousands of employees that the variance will only be 1.5 centimeters from the professional to the employee. So we can empower employees, we can give them tools, and we can give them um, the capabilities. Um, the other interesting research is um, what's called the IKEA effect. And it shows that um, people that buy IKEA furniture will keep that furniture longer than other pieces of furniture that they've invested more in. And ultimately, the reason is pride of ownership. You know, they had their hands involved in building this, so there's an understanding and, and a pride there. And the same thing occurs uh, with workstations. So by giving and empowering the employee, uh, we're able to um, give them that pride of ownership and give them that control, which allows them um, to be uh, better accommodated for their work. All right, we're going to finish up with the ROI and next steps. So looking at uh, return on investment, most organizations have focused on injury statistics. And again, if the injury statistics for ergonomics are low, it's not a very compelling message. So what we've been doing is looking at surveys of discomfort and, and plugging that discomfort into a model from the American Medical Association, which shows that, for example, someone with back pain or neck pain can lose up to five and a half hours of lost productivity each week. And if you annualize that, that's six weeks a year of lost productivity. So if we were to use that model, and we have an ROI calculator that we can share with you if you'd like to um, use your data to come up with a similar calculation. If you were to have 1,000 employees and 30% of them had high discomfort, again, weekly or daily discomfort, you could see they would lose five and a half hours of productivity per week. That would be, for those 1,000 employees at 30%, 1,650 hours per week. If you were to use a compensation rate, combined with benefits and facilities management, et cetera, of $50 per hour. That's $53,000 per week. A significant amount. If we were to take that same 1,000 employees and look at an annualized cost, that's $3.6 million per year of lost productivity. Now, do we need to um, improve productivity 100% to recoup that whole uh, ROI that we're advocating for? No. I mean, if we can just get 10% of that productivity back, that's $360,000. And again, multiply that over and over again. So in addition to productivity, which we can measure and we can quantify using a model like that, there's employee engagement. So the research is out there, and many of you probably have employee engagement plans, that show the more the employee is engaged, the more the business results increase. So from improved earnings per share, our EPS, um, to Best Buy has a great example where when they increased employee engagement by 0.1%, they saw $100,000 of sales increase per store. Now, our argument is that if people aren't comfortable, how can they be engaged? If they're distracted with discomfort and they're distracted with fatigue based on a workstation design or a workplace design, how can we expect them to be engaged? So leveraging some of this data and leveraging the priority that your organization has probably already put into this area and connecting it with uh, the effort of the workspace design is critical. Now, what's the message? You know, we were talking about messaging and personas. Let's think a little bit about the messaging for executives when we're talking about return on investment and what drives them. Um, so we've done a large research study with um, the Fortune 500, and we had about 25% of the Fortune 500 respond in the health and safety sector. And we asked them these questions on the right. Do executives care about ergonomics? And do executives believe ergonomics can affect profitability? And you can see from the Fortune 500 um, who have strong funding sources, the overwhelming response was yes. 
However, what was most surprising is when we asked the last question, would ergonomics be better accepted if it were associated with employee efficiency? You can see the majority, 92%, said yes. So why haven't we been using that message? Why have we been using uh, other messages of pain and discomfort and injuries and, and those type of messages? Well, we've been, we moved away from, I think, an original successful message. And, and on the left is a demonstration of that. This is an advertisement for a chair in the 1920s. And you can see the headline, fresh, happy, energetic, and efficient operators are seated on do more chairs. So there was a message that was used for this workstation design. And why we got away from it is why we're not seeing ergonomics advance at a, more, uh, at a pace that we see, for example, technology advancing. So there's huge opportunities. So what are your next steps? We're concluding now. We're going to open up for questions. But I want to make sure that you have a few steps to walk away with where you can either look at your plan and make sure that you've uh, addressed these and start to put together your plan and make sure that you have these steps in mind. And these are the steps we work with our clients on when we're developing their plan. So the first is, what is your roadmap? You know, I had a boss that used to take uh, vacations, and they would pack up with a family of five for a week, and they would get to the end of the road, and they would all vote, do we turn right or do we turn left? That's an interesting vacation uh, plan, but I don't think it's interesting as a good adjective for a corporate plan. So the first step you have to do is develop the roadmap. Where do you want to be? What are your objectives? And how will you build business case. How will you use your messaging to compel the right stakeholders? The second step is initiate the engagement. So we just talked about in the persona-based section uh, engagement and how important that is to understanding motivation, to understanding uh, frustrations. And that's not just the employee level. That's all stakeholders. So really looking at the who, what, when, where, and how. How will you initiate that? Who are the stakeholders? And how will you make sure that engagement is achieved so that your plan um, doesn't um, leave out some of those personas that are part of your workforce and are very important? Step three, develop the policy process and collateral. So how will you be um, delivering your collateral? What's your policy so that you can make sure that all the stakeholders have been addressed, that all of their objectives are included in the policy? I mean, oftentimes we see departments write policies that are built for silos. You know, they're built for their department. They achieve the department's objective, but they don't include uh, the stakeholders. And that's why policies become you know, dusty binders on the shelf, is because they were developed for a certain group. And when you try to roll that out, you haven't engaged the stakeholders. You haven't engaged the employee population. And without those uh, critical uh, deliverables, there will be a, a disconnect. How will you leverage technology? We're integrating technology more and more into our workspace. So what is your plan to include technology in your messaging, in your policy, in your delivery model? How do you, as we talked about home workers in that section, how do you create more self-service models and virtualized models so that you can support this growing trend? And so what are the tools available to you internally? What are the tools that you need to explore? And how do they integrate? And then you have to tie it all together. You have to have a plan. You have to have milestones. You have to have expectations. Oftentimes, we see clients just stop with implementation. They have all these great steps in place to get something implemented. And then it's like you know, after day one, there's no steps. And we know that you know, you're going to have to adapt, just like the employees have to adapt, based on things that you didn't collect and based on new information. And then finally, what's your metric policy? You know, what is your metric plan, your key performance indicators? How will you follow up with the stakeholders to make sure that their objectives are being achieved and communicate with them so they continue to champion and support your initiative? Um, how will you report those metrics? How will you make sure people are involved? And the results, there's tons of results that we have, um, not only from our clients, but from using this approach. And uh, all of those are listed here. Some of the more interesting ones you may um, find are higher satisfaction for customers, increased productivity, and increased profitability. I appreciate your attention today. Uh, we will be sending out this presentation afterwards. And uh, I know some of you may need to uh, leave the webinar now for your other appointments. However, uh, we will be available now for questions. Yes, thank you, Rick. That was really interesting. Um, I'll give them just a minute or two to get some questions in, because I know it takes a little bit to type it all in there. 
Someone is asking, Rick, have you had any experience with using inflatable exercise balls as office chairs? Any huh. recommendations on this? Sure. It's a uh, it's an interesting trend, and it was uh, really um, presented from uh, fitness professionals. You know, the idea behind it is that uh, in order to sit on a fitness ball, you have to engage your core, and by engaging your core, you're using good postures. And that is true. Unfortunately, our bodies are not designed to sustain that active engagement for long periods of time. So there's been adaptations to these that create you know, bases with wheels so you can roll them around uh, with lumbar supports. But the, the bottom line principle is that um, our recommendation is they're not really designed for the office. If you want to have a room which is a fitness relaxation room and people use it there, um, you know, we encourage that. But you know, even the safety hazards of these balls popping, which is uh, not wholly uncommon, um, are people falling off of them, uh, creates enough risk that we don't believe that they belong in the, the workplace unless there's a specific application. Okay, we have a question from Dennis Foley. Okay, Dennis, your question is? Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, now I can hear you. Yeah, <clears throat> I would like to know what your opinion is with headrests. Headrests, headrests. sure. So, I mean, headrests were originally introduced as, um, you know, executive stature. You know, if you look at the, the evolution of executive chairs, for example, they all include headrests. And it was almost that stature of a higher chair means more important. So is there a particular benefit to headrests? There are with people with cervical neck issues. And technology users that do work um, in, prefer working in a, in a reclined position. So if that is the only position that they're comfortable in, um, the headrest can support them. Um, but in general, for the large population that is doing forward-facing work, which is in, involving keyboards, input devices, monitors, papers, et cetera, the headrest is not a requirement. And in, in many cases, if they're sitting correctly in their chair, they won't be able to engage the headrest. They would only be able to engage it in a reclined position. Now, some chairs, um, you know, the, the Freedom Chair, for example, the headrest, as you recline, the headrest engages. So there are some good designs that accommodate both postures. And that's what we encourage is ergonomics the next, the best posture is the next posture. But in general, uh, if we were to look at the average population, a headrest is not necessary. Okay, we have quite a few questions coming in here. Um, what about using treadmill walking workstations? <laughs> Another popular trend, the treadmill walking workstation. So the idea behind the tread, treadmill walking workstation, if you're not familiar with it, is you basically put a treadmill under a height adjustable desk and you walk at a slow pace while you're working. Um, so, you know, good idea and principle that you're moving and you're addressing that sedentary uh, work environment. However, the Mayo Clinic just released research that shows that using those treadmill workstations decreases your accuracy. So you're increasing your health, but you're having more errors, which makes you work longer. So there, there's not a measurable impact there. Um, so, you know, again, it's all about the environment and the application. If someone was, um, for example, if those of you attending this webinar had been on a treadmill watching, great, that's a good application. But if the idea that we're going to be able to create content, uh, typing, mousing, and be engaged uh, in our computer in a meaningful way while walking on a treadmill um, hasn't shown an, enough significant evidence at this time. Great. So and one of the things we have another one. Sure. I just want to include one thing. With that open workspace and open work plan, that's an idea where you can have a treadmill room where people know that they're going to go to that room for particular activities. Um, you know, you can even go back to um, Aristotle and Socrates, and they used to create this uh, large walking area around their spaces so that they would take these walking meetings for brainstorming, things like that. So um, those are some of the things that you want to think about with the application. Sorry, Joshua. Go ahead. Uh, this is my fault. How many standing height stations are common for 5,000 employees? For 5,000 employees. Ergonomic, are currently going through an ergonomic assessment um, completed first. If that employee qualifies, we work on raising their station or office furniture. Sure. Well, the, the data we looked at uh, earlier in the presentation that, that you'll, you'll receive with the presentation shows that if you've got a fixed work height, 
at 29 inches. That accommodates you know, f people from 5'8 to 6'1. Um, so depending on the size of your population, um, you, you have two ways to address that. Again, we showed that in the presentation. You can you know, raise their chair and move their chair, provide footrest. You can provide keyboard trays. So a sit-stand workstation is not required for any part of the population. The best applications for it that we've seen from research are people with pain and specific issues. However, as I mentioned, there is an ROI as far as facilities, return on investment, for if you're moving people a lot and you have a lot of churn and you're adjusting fixed height workstations to accommodate the workers so they can work on the work surface, there is a return on investment. And we do have that data if you're interested in it. We have um, you know, shared with clients. So if you want to see the calculations on the return on investment for using sit sand workstations in that uh, plan, uh, we can share that with you. But if the, the question about how many are needed for 5,000 employees, well, it depends. You know, the only time it's absolutely needed and shows results is with the pain-related symptoms. The rest of the uh, population we can accommodate in different ways, and it just depends on your priority as far as your, your workspace plan. Okay, great. Um, we have quite a few questions left, but we are a little bit over. So um, we'll try to answer a couple more, but the remaining questions, I'll follow up with Rick to email um, those people directly, okay? Um, we do have a real good one quick. Are there any books or literature you would recommend to help promote movement behaviors? Yes, um, we do have some, some literature. I'll, um, I know our operations leader has been creating movement campaigns that's research-based for our clients, so um, I'll, I'll follow up with that as um, an action item, Joshua, where we're, when we send out the presentation, we can reference those. Okay, excellent. Um, I'll try to get one more in. Um, my local IFMA chapter had a tour of the new NPR headquarters. Every person was measured for a desk for desk height. Do you see that as a trend in new buildings? Well, um, again, if, if you do adjust desk height to accommodate the worker, that is helpful. We know that, that that's uh, valuable. However, I've re referenced throughout the presentation, the ROI on that doesn't make sense if you're having people move a lot. So, you know, using this NPR example, if, you know, the average lifespan of someone at a workstation is going to be two to three years, um, that may make sense. If these people move and they allocate uh, based on projects and based on organizational needs and are moving much more frequently, um, then the return on investment is not there. It would be better to introduce adjustable tables for those environments that move. And then that, that is also assuming, I haven't seen the NPR facility, what kind of workspace plan is being implemented. Is it an open space plan? Is it fixed workstations and cubicles and offices? So all of those things uh, come into play. But adjusting the workstation height for individual employees is a good practice. Uh, it just has to be, you have to consider all the applications of that. And again, the return on investment to make sure that that's the right um, decision for your organization. Great, thank you. Okay, since we are over time, like I said, um, the questions that have been sent in, I will get with Rick, and we will follow up with you all by email. Um, I thank you very much, Rick, for your time. It was great, and we had great response. All right, thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.